one of the biggest creatures on Earth feeds on some of the tiniest. The wide mouth of the whale shark scoops up microscopic organisms which drift near the surface. Yet, big as it is, and small as they are, they have much in common. The cells of these tiny organisms are of a similar type to the cells which make the body of the shark. Some will actually grow into larger creatures. They are larvae of fish, crabs and lobsters. But if you look carefully, you can see drifting and swimming amongst them much smaller cells, mere dots by comparison. Those are bacteria, and they are quite different. In fact, the difference between these types of cells is of great importance. All life is divided into two types of cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryote means before the nucleus, and that takes in the bacteria. Eukaryote means true nucleus, and that includes all multicelled life and some pretty strange single-celled organisms called the protus, which is what I'm collecting here. Go down to your local swamp or duck pond, collect some scum, and have a look through a microscope at the amazing community of microorganisms in it. You'll see bacteria as little dots swimming around, and you'll see larger and more complex cells. These bigger ones are protists, which are single-celled eukaryotes. They are obviously much more complicated than bacteria. In fact, they look like cells within cells. And cells within cells is a good description of eukaryotes. We think that around one and a half billion years ago, that's exactly how they started. Eukaryotes developed in a world markedly changed from earlier times. Early prokaryotes, over some two billion years, had evolved a vital chemical process, photosynthesis, converting solar energy into chemical energy. One product of photosynthesis is oxygen, and photosynthetic bacteria, over eons, raised the oxygen level in the atmosphere. Oxygen offered a new way of life, the aerobic way, and aerobic bacteria also appeared. In this diversified and no doubt more competitive environment, eukaryotes were yet another development. How big a development becomes clear when we look at a eukaryote-like amoeba. This thing is much bigger than a bacterium. It moves and flexes itself in a way that is not seen in bacteria. It contains many complicated looking bodies, including a nucleus, which bacteria don't have. Its way of life is clearly more complex than prokaryotes, although not for a second should we consider it superior. After all, it still shares a world teeming with successful prokaryotic life forms. Rather, our interest in eukaryotes is because this type of cell is the basis of our own branch of life. In whatever form they appear, eukaryotic cells certainly do look like cells within cells. It may be that eukaryotes were the first true phagocytes, that is, cells which eat other cells. This stentor is trying to sweep smaller cells into its gullet, where it will engulf them. This requires a thin, flexible exomembrane to surround and ingest them. Bacteria don't have this. They have a rigid outer cell wall. And if they're going to digest food, they secrete enzymes out through the wall and absorb the products. On the other hand, the wall prevents them from swelling up and bursting from water absorption. In eukaryotes like stentor, though, the exomembrane is no protection against bursting. Stentor uses a contractile vacuole like a bilge pump to combat the water continuously leaking in. It's a case of alternative strategies. On the other hand, some problems can only have one answer. For example, while the diffusion of water through the exomembrane, that is osmosis, must be held in check, cells need molecules of gas and nutrients to diffuse in 
and waste products to diffuse out at quite rapid rates. Diffusion is the tendency of molecules to drift from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Fast diffusion only works across tiny distances, so no part of a cell can be more than a few microns from its outside environment. All cells must stay tiny or be incredibly thin. Bigger organisms cannot be made of bigger cells. They have to be cooperations of many microscopic ones. So if a eukaryotic cell looks like cells within a cell, is that literally true? Could they be bacteria in there? That's an interesting question and the answer is yes and no. When we look at them closely through an electron microscope we can see many similarities between organelles and free living prokaryotes. These mitochondria for example look very much like bacteria but when we look at them closely we find that their DNA is not enough to keep them alive as free living organisms. So what we have is probably an example of a very ancient endosymbiosis and over millions of years the bacteria have given up some of their DNA to their host cell. Mitochondria and chloroplasts, maybe they were free living once but now they're an integral part of the eukaryotic cell. It's complicated because for other organelles like the nucleus itself there's no evidence of a free living origin. A cell is a self-sustaining chemical factory. It needs energy, and to get it, it needs fuel. Stentor's energy comes from the organic molecules it digests from its prey, reacted with oxygen diffused in from the surrounding water. Another approach is photosynthesis. This diatom has green chloroplasts, which are capable of using the energy of light to build organic molecules directly from carbon dioxide and water. Photosynthesis also releases oxygen, bubbles of which can be seen coming off this algae. The sum of all cell processes is called metabolism. Metabolism drives the cell, and the cell drives the organism, no matter how small or big. Metabolic activity divides into two categories, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is the process of breaking large molecules down into smaller ones, which releases energy for activity. In eukaryotes, this means the controlled burning of carbon compounds with oxygen. Anabolism is the opposite process of building more complex molecules from simpler ones, and this uses up energy. For example, the activity of growing, of creating new cells to become more bone, muscles, and all the other parts of a multicellular body requires energy to drive this anabolic process. Of course, the most important anabolic process of all is considered to be photosynthesis. Since the energy needed to make the complex molecules produced by photosynthesis comes free from space, this process is regarded as the ultimate source of energy for almost all life on Earth. In this sense, those little green chloroplasts are the most important organelles of all. Sure, we can see organelles through a microscope, but it doesn't tell us what they do. To do that, we need to get a little brutal. First, we grab some tissue, some ordinary spinach, and add it to a household blender. Give it a quick buzz. Now this has created a cell soup, which we'll now take to the centrifuge. First we add our cell soup in a tube. This spins very, very fast and works like super gravity. Inside, the heavy particles fall to the bottom in the pellet. To get it going, we add a safety lid, close the lid, and press the go button. Now that the centrifuge is finished, we can remove our tube. Now you can see here a pellet has been formed by the heaviest particles falling to the bottom of the tube. 
and we can conduct chemical tests on this to find out how they react. That's how we know the chloroplasts are involved in photosynthesis because we can separate them. That's how we know that mitochondria is involved in respiration because we can separate them. And that's how we know that the DNA is mostly found in the nucleus and so on. In fact, we can use an ultra-fast centrifuge to even separate molecules of different sizes. So what do we know about the complex and active interior of a eukaryotic cell? Let's take an animated tour. First we approach the plasma membrane, which as we pass through, we see as a lipid bilayer. Lots of special proteins stick through it, acting as selective receptors and pathways to move molecules in and out. Small molecules like water sneak through everywhere. It's very flexible and self-sealing, so it can engulf particles and carry them inside. Inside, it's a mass of strands and organelles, which we've coloured to make them easier to distinguish. In reality, they're nearly all transparent, and we're not moving through empty space, but through a thick and soupy cytoplasm. It's laced through with fibres of protein. The thin green ones are called microfilaments, and the thicker blue ones are microtubules, because they're hollow. Both kinds make up a kind of skeleton for the cell called the cytoskeleton. But this skeleton is incredible. It's a shape changer. When you see a cell contract or bend, you're looking at the effect of protein molecules in the cytoskeleton, using energy to change shape or to slide across each other. Tiny molecular motors anchored in the cytoskeleton power beating cilia or flagella. In fact, muscle power on whatever scale, is the cytoskeleton at work. Back in our cyber cell, we run into more strange objects. Inside the mitochondrion is where the oxygen-consuming reaction that produces most of the cell's energy takes place. The folded bag of the Golgi apparatus is like a post office for special proteins. It packages them and sends them to specific places. For example, remember the food particle we saw come in? To digest its contents, a package of digestive enzymes is sent to fuse with it. Hundreds of different protein packages have jobs to do in the cell. The basic proteins are made here in the endoplasmic reticulum. These little dark dots called ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. Some are also found floating free in the cytoplasm. Then, hidden behind the layers of endoplasmic reticulum, is the nucleus, protected by its own nuclear membrane. Inside here, we see lots of fibrous threads and a nucleolus, where ribosomes are being made. It's the threads, called chromatin, which holds the crucial molecules of the cell's existence. The chromatin proteins are like spindles and wrapping paper for the nano-thin but immensely long molecules of DNA from which all the instructions for cell chemistry are drawn. A human cell has as much as two meters of DNA in every nucleus. When the cell starts to divide, these chromatin proteins draw the DNA even tighter into the characteristic shapes of chromosomes. Of course, once biochemists realized that DNA ultimately controlled all the cell processes, including this feat of cellular reproduction, they set to work to find out how. For a custom copy of this program, contact ABC Commercial on 1300 650 587 or visit abc.net.au slash program sales.